Tonight on Chimstock Africa, my guest is award-winning gospel artist Ntokozo Mbambo of South Africa. She sits down with me to talk about her journey with God, her journey in her calling, as well as her recent journey with grief. Tonight on Chimstock Africa. Do that. Please like this video and leave a comment below. Let us know what you think. And don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell button and share this video with someone. From Cape Town to Cairo and from Magadishu to Dakar, this is Chim's Talk Africa. And now here's your host, Chim Onyibilanma. Hi there, welcome to this segment of your show. Like I told you in the introduction, we have the pleasure of having with us a gift from South Africa, uh, a treasure, I would say, because uh, I, the Bible talks about, about men and women who have been given us gifts. And uh, Sister Ntoko Zombambo, you are a gift to the church and to the gift to the world. Welcome to the show. Amen. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today. It's my pleasure. I, I thank God for your life. And I want us to explain a bit about your journey. I know you've been, you've talked about this so many times. Do you, does it get tiring sometimes? I mean, like, uh, there's, there's a current term boom. I don't know if you've ever heard of current term boom. Been prison during World War II, the hiding place. And she said she had to be like going everywhere, repeating the same testimony for decades. Does it get tired? <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes, but the story must be told. <laughs> it must be told. To the glory of God, yes, too. Sir. Because your story is a God story. Mm. You are an Umlazi girl. Yes. You grew up in Umlazi, a, a suburb, uh, we would say township here yeah. in Dorbert, in, in KwaZulu Natal. But let's talk about the influence of your mom, your late mom, mm. uh, from discovering you, so to say. Mm to mentoring you. Tell us, tell us, just spend some good time. Let's talk about what your mom meant mm. in your life before we even talk about her passing. <laughs> um, well, I, 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 just to clarify, I'm probably, it might sound cliche or taboo, but I grew up in a, Christ, a Christian home, um, a very strict one as well. My mother was the worship leader in our church and my father actually used to do sound in our church uh, where I grew up in and, um, I always say that my first encounter with what a worship leader is was through seeing my mom minister in church, in the church that I, I grew up. She is the first worship leader that I that I saw. And um, when I saw her, I saw, I, I, I could say that I saw my future when I saw her on stage leading the congregation into praise and worship. Um, I saw my destiny. I saw that, hey, I actually, do that you know being a little kid um, in the church and so I grew up in that environment where literally almost every day we were in church as a family uh, my father also sang in the choir so I grew up in a, in a very musical family <laughs> uh, music was just our daily bread you know before our devotions at the end of the day at night before you go to bed we would always sing together as a family and then my father would uh, read a word or my mom would say something um, and you know and encourage us in the word of God and then we'd pray together as a family so I grew up in that kind of environment where it's just every day it's Jesus and music Jesus and music Jesus and God music and um, I, I, I always say that that is was such an incredible foundation you know and um, the way that our parents did it back then was just amazing you know and so inspiring because even today it's what I aspire to be for my children and the first people who actually realized that there was something different about me was my parents mm -hmm. was my mother and my father I remember this one time I was actually four years old. My mom always tells, used to tell the story. I was four years old um, and she was rehearsing her solo that she was going to sing during offering time at church. And it was a backing track. You remember the cassettes way back in the days, the radio cassettes. So she was rehearsing her um, solo. And apparently when well, I was in the room with her while she was rehearsing the solo and apparently I started singing along. 
um, as the song went by, she was looking at me, eyeing me, and then she did it again, and then I was singing with her. And then the third time she said, okay, I'm gonna sing it on my own. And then I sang the song from beginning to end. And then they had some meeting with my dad, and then they decided, no, I'm gonna sing the song on Sunday, not her anymore. It's no longer her song, but it's my song. And then Sunday came, and then it was like a big thing in our church. Dog was on, and it was like, yeah. And that, that was your first public, your first public performance. First encounter with an audience at four years old, and it's an, it's quite amazing that I still remember that. Um, I remember exactly how I felt. I remember exactly what was going through my mind, and some of the the words. You know, when you're a four year old, you can't even pronounce some of the words yeah. right. <laughs> so there's also that. And I went on stage, grabbed the microphone, and I sang the song from beginning to end. Um, and all I remember is that. At the end of the song, I just threw the microphone on the floor and ran to my mother because I was crying. <laughs> I dropped the mic and ran to my mom because I was crying. And and my mother was that for my entire life. She was always my, my saving grace. She was always, um, you know... <sighs> a reflection of what God sees in me. Um, and, and she was exactly that. She was always so encouraging, um, so uplifting, so kind and so generous. And, and I was so grateful, um, even with my kids as well. Sometimes I'd look at her and be like, but why, but why are you so nice to these ones? You know, but you, for, to me, you were very strict. She's like, ah, uh -uh, you'll never understand it until you become a grandmother, <laughs> you know? And she was such a blessing to us. I, um, even, especially when, when my husband and I would have to travel, we always knew that our kids would be mm -hmm. sorted out because mom would mm -hmm. just leave everything. She would drop everything and just come and watch and be with her grandbabies or she'd come and pick them up and um, and, and and take them back home mm. to where she was. And um, I'm truly grateful that I got the mother that I had. How was, a, you know, you, 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 you came to public attention, 15 year old. You still hold that record, don't you? The youngest ever <laughs> member of Joyous Celebration. I do you? I or has somebody broken that record? <laughs> I think I still hold that record. <laughs> youngest ever member of, uh, youngest ever member of uh, Joyous Celebration, yeah. 15 years old. What, what, what was your mom's role in that? You know, just tell us how that happened and what role she played there. Um, how it happened was my my mother and my father actually were very close friends with Pastor Mtunzi Namba and his wife. Um, so I grew up whereby they were literally my second parents. And Pastor Mtunzi Namba is part of the founding members of Joyous Celebration. And... Um, so they could see that there is something going on and they were just, you know, eyeing from a distance and, and waiting for the opportune time. And I think at 15, they decided, the adults. <laughs> just like that. Remember the four-year-old. <laughs> exactly. They decided again. <laughs> Without telling me, they decided that, no, now it's time for me to join Joy Celebration. And, and you know, I've said the rest is history. And from that moment onwards, um, I'm so blessed to have the parents that I had. Because from that moment onwards, as much as I was a 15-year-old, you'd think, oh, boy, what, what are these parents thinking? You know, um, there's so much that happens in the entertainment industry um, it's full of sharks it's full of you know um, opportunists um, there's um, abuse. exploitation abuse and so forth the beautiful thing about my parents is that they made sure that they traveled with us everywhere that we went mm -hmm. No matter where it was, if Joy Celebration was in Cape Town, my parents would fly themselves to Cape Town, book accommodation, and just be there, and just be present, and come backstage, and make their presence known that, hey, this child is not alone. <laughs> this child has parents who are looking out for her. And because of that, that always um, set me apart in the, in the sense that I always had felt like I was shielded mm -hmm. the entire time, you know? So it was never easy for um, distractions and for me to be exploited and abused because my parents literally set up a force around me and they were part of that force that was just constantly surrounding me. When my dad couldn't make it, my mom made sure that she was there every single performance, um, screaming the loudest, <laughs> you know, when I walk on stage. And, and, and that was such a blessing, you know, because I, it's so important for a child to feel affirmed mm -hmm. and, and, and to know that, you know what, I've got a strong support behind me, so I can do this, you know, because it's so easy to, to be intimidated, especially if you're a 15-year-old, because everybody's older than you. 
everybody's got themselves figured out. Everybody, you know, they, they know what they're doing. You know, I'm still trying to figure out what, eh? So how do I grab a microphone? Like, do I hold it like this? Do I hold it like, you know, I'm still trying to figure it out. And to have um, that support that says, baby, you've got it. Mm. You know, we're here. Don't worry about it. Mm. Don't stress, you know. Um, and, and the thing is, sometimes people come to you and say, mean things as well. I remember someone came to me and said, um, and I was still a kid, I was 15. And they said, why are you trying to be me? Um, and, and, and I was like, but I'm not trying to be, I'm just doing what I'm just doing my, exactly. I'm just a 15 year old that's trying to navigate this huge thing that I've been put into. And, and, and I remember I would always tell my parents something. I would always go back to my mom or my dad and be like, someone said this and this and they were like, baby, You've got this. Don't worry yourself about what people say. Focus on God. Focus all your eyes upon him and he will lead you and direct you into what to do and what not to do. Forget about what people say, you know, ignore them. And I remember there was this one time whereby when I released my first album, uh, someone called me inside and said, no, while I was still in Joyous, because I, I started releasing albums while I was still part of the group. Yeah. And I remember that um, while I was in the group, someone came to me um, outside of the group, though, and they said, why did you release a contemporary gospel album? Because back then, contemporary gospel wasn't a thing. You know, it was the traditional um, vibes only, you know, and they were like, no, but why did you do that? That's such a waste of time and, and money. You know, you're wasting your parents' money um, by doing this contemporary music. Maybe you should rather just do R&B because your voice is uh, more suited to it. And I'm like, no, but I don't believe, that's not what I believe what God has called me for. And they were like, no, don't spiritualize this. <laughs> you know, you need to make money and this is not going to make you any money. You know, go exactly. That's exactly what they said. And I went back home and I told my mom, <laughs> and my mom wanted to go to that person and she was, she was like, hey. <laughs> my dad had to calm her down and be like, I, I know, to pay no attention to them. You know, <laughs> that's just the devil. Still talking about how they protected you. Talk about how they protected you through this. You know, you're, you're here exposed to all of this, but they protected you to make sure you got your education. Talk about what yeah. they did there. <laughs> um, so you were able to go ahead in the midst of performing, yes. being out there and still got your certificate. Tell us yeah. about that. What did they do to make you be on the... Ooh, they made a deal. Now. They made a deal with me. My parents sat me down um, when they decided that um, it's time for me to join Joyous Celebration. They asked me if I wanted to go and I was like, yes, yes, I do want to do it. And then they said, this is on one condition that your schoolwork cannot suffer. You have to make sure that as much as you excel, with the joyous thing, your schoolwork must also excel. If for some reason, excuse me, for some reason, the schoolwork goes down, then we take this joyous thing away. Then you, you, it's by. It's not gonna happen anymore. So I was like, yo. <laughs> and my parents don't make empty threats. <laughs> so I had to really work extra hard. I remember I would even do extra classes with some of my schoolmates. My classmates would be so helpful as well, um, especially with, with the subjects that I was, uh, you know, just a little fuzzy with because there were times when I'd, I'd have to miss school um, but the beautiful thing is that most of the time the joyous thing would be during weekends or during school holidays Slumpe, if I missed a day it would probably be like one day here and there um, but that would be it and and I always had extra help from my friends in school who were always there like hey this is what we're doing now and some would call me and be like listen there's a new project that we have to do I'm going to send you um, some things to look up just so that you keep in touch and, and know what's happening in class and be like thank you thank you thank you thank you so i had such a um i think that's just god man god ordering people around and ordering my steps and making sure that i'm covered in all areas yeah. let's talk about god and you so you grew up in a christian home and it's so easy when you're born in a christian home to just be christian mm. you've always been christian i mean me born again yeah i'm born again <laughs> when did it become real for you where did your own relationship with god start I mean, when did you become born again? Yeah. You know, the, the funny thing is uh, I grew up in a Christian home. Um, so th this, I knew how to play the part. I know what you mean. I knew how to, what to do, when to do it. I knew how to pretend like you're being blessed by a word. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I could, yeah. 
Yeah, and I could sing. And when I sang, the anointing would flow there. and people would cry. So I was like, Psh. She's I mean, She's I, I'm saved, Moss. You know, I've got this hands down, you know. I used to think that um, um, being saved is... Um, What's, what's the word is 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 will be by default mm. just because my parents mm. are in this Christian thing or in this Jesus vibes thing. So then automatically, you know, it must mean that I'm also uh, on that path. But I had an, an aunt who was every now and then, I think, I think the Holy Spirit, I always say the Holy Spirit used you and I was not happy at that time. <laughs> every now and then she would come to me and ask me, when did you get saved? When did you receive Christ? I know when you started singing, exactly. but I want to know when you And she's like, because I don't remember. And I've known you all my... And that's the thing. She's an aunt that literally lived with us my entire life. When I was a kid, I literally grew up in front of her. She was with us. So if indeed I had accepted Christ, she would be part of the people who would know. Every now and then she's like, oh, I see you, but when did, when did you accept Christ? Because I do not remember that. I remember at some point I started lying and be like, no, but I did. You weren't there that one Sunday and I accepted him at, at Sunday school. And she would be like, uh -uh, I'm not convinced. There's no way that you wouldn't remember the day that this happens, you know, uh, because it's profound. It's something that you, you can't just forget about. So you can't tell me that you forgot when it happened. So I'm like, oh gosh, no. But then the conviction, you know, within the inner man was like, mm, but girl, the truth of the matter is you just know about the God of your parents, mm -hmm. but you don't know the God, your God. You don't know him for yourself. You know the God of everybody else but you have never experienced him yourself and then the, she i believe that she sowed that seed of mm. of of hunger and of of a deeper desire of a longing um to know more about this god and and then i was like yeah but now that i think about it mm. i've never actually done it you know and, and a friend of mine who also f was feeling the same way mm. at that time and you know we both grew up in the same church so that one and then i remember that um, there was a time um, that we had in our church, um, like uh, revivals that were happening in during the week. We had an, a tent outside and there was revivals that were happening during the week. And then I remember that one day we were like, hey, I know we must do it. This is the day, my friend and I. And indeed, when the altar call was called by the pastors, I even remember who the pastor was. Every now and, now and then I remind him that, do you? Do you know that that you led me to Christ? <laughs> you know, and 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 it was such a beautiful moment. I always say, I don't even remember when I stood up. I don't even remember walking to the altar, but I just remember being at the altar, almost like I was elevated and 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 I don't know, like I was on a ride somehow, um, whether it was on a skateboard or, or whether I was floating and, and landed at the altar, it literally felt like something picked me up and just walked me all the way to the altar because I found myself at the altar and, and that was it. And, and it was at that moment actually where purpose for me became so alive. It was at that moment when I accepted Christ where a light bulb just flashed and I saw where God wanted me to go and I saw God's plan for my life and I saw God's purpose and I've never looked back since then. How old were you then? I was 13. Mm. I was 13. Mm. That was two years before Joy was. Yeah. I was 13. We've talked so much about your foundation, your parents, your mom. One of the biggest things that has hit you so bad in this recent time is the passing away of your mom. Yeah. And uh, this was 2021? 2020. 2020. Yeah. Tell us how, how you, well, first of all, tell us how you felt about it. And I want to just hear how God took you through a valley of weeping. Yeah. And uh, yeah, how did, how did it hit you? It hit me bad. It hit me bad. Um, I still don't think there are words to describe what it feels like. Um, it, I, I, I remember this one time I told my husband that it felt like someone took my heart and just literally just 
shredded into pieces, mm -hmm. you know, um, because I mean, from the stories you've heard, mm -hmm. you know, that would explain that my mom and I were two peas in a pot. We were like this, um, you know, and and she was like that with even my husband, because someone would be like, ah, but what kind of mother is this that is missing in another mm -hmm. in her baby's marriage? No, but she was like that with even my husband, <laughs> you know, he would. I remember he would also say that he wished he didn't have such a great relationship with her mm -hmm. because then it wouldn't have hurt as much mm -hmm. as it did, you know. And because that's the kind of person that she was. She, the, she, when she walked into a room, you would notice her and she would light up a room. She would, she just radiated God's glory in such a, a magnificent way. I was always so envious about her and, and, and how charming she could be um, and how fun she was as well. Although she was strict, she was also very fun to be around as well. And... Um, so it was really just so heartbreaking. It literally, honestly, felt like my heart was ripped out of my body and just shred into pieces and thrown on the floor. And there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. It was it was crippling. I felt, um, you know, it was it was insane. It was insane. It was in it. It's inexplainable the kind of pain um, that I went through at that moment because you're like. It can't be because, like, mm. just a you were here just and now a few you, weeks yeah, ago. you were here. What do you mean that they're no longer here? How can I exist without her in this world, you know? And, and it made me question a lot of things, you know, because we were praying for her healing, mm. we were praying that, you know, and we were confident, we even had a word, you know, um, we were, we were speaking, you know, like, um, um, Ezekiel, when he spoke to those dry bones and um, the word of the Lord said, speak mm -hmm. to those dry. So that's what we were doing. We were speaking to the dry bones and we we're like, you're going to live, mm -hmm. you know, let the breath of God come alive in you once again, you know, um, let the bone marrow mm -hmm. come together, we you know, believing. exactly. We were strong in faith and we were believing we were standing together as a family and, you know, and things didn't happen as we expected. You know, and, so and made it made me question a lot of things. And um, I, I definitely went into depression. Um, there was no way I, I couldn't have, you know, I didn't want to pray. I didn't want to, I didn't want to go to church. I mean, it helped that we were already in locked lockdown. Down. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody, not too many so, people noticed. Exactly. So I couldn't be forced to go to church. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to serve. Mm. I, I just... I was just, I was angry. I didn't want to minister. I was just angry. Mm. I was angry. I was bitter because I did not understand why, why her. Why, yeah, why, why her specifically? Mm. You know, I'm not saying that others could have gone, but you know, but why this one? You know, why am I most prized? Um, you know, and, and, and it was a very difficult time. Yeah. <laughs>I hope you were blessed as much as I was by that conversation. That, that's just part one. Next week we'll be looking at how she got uh, the journey of her healing from this uh, grief. Uh, but you know, before I, before I go into my last uh, thing I want to say to you before we go this week, I want to tell you that Ntokozo Mbambo is having an album launch this month of March, on the 24th and on the 25th in Durban as well as in Joburg, she'll be having a new album launch along with a special guest, Natania Basi from Nigeria. You don't want to miss this uh, concert. Uh, uh, use the information on the screen to get the information you need to be able to attend this concert. I'll be going there, I'll see you there. Now, before we go, I just want to call you and encourage you to pray for an unreached people group. The Anjuram people in the northeastern part of Kenya. These are ethnically Somali people, but they are called the Anjuram people, a nomadic group of people who, who, who move from place to place, wherever they can get pasture and uh, land to be able to for their livelihood. But the reason why I'm bringing them to your attention is the fact that almost 100% of this ethnic group are Muslims. Think about it, and it bothers me. When I look at different small ethnic groups in different countries in Africa, uh, where you have majority Christians, take Kenya, for example, the large population of Christians, to still have this 
enclave of an ethnic group that counts themselves as almost 100% Muslims. Uh, that should bother us. The Lord Jesus died so that they will be saved. And I want to encourage you to add the Anjuran people of northeastern Kenya into your prayers. Uh, and you know, one of the things I want you to pray for is that God will send medical missionaries there. Uh, medical services are very much lacking among these people and medical missionaries can make a huge difference. Would you please pray that God will send medical missionaries among them? Pray also that God will send more missionaries among them. There's also a need for veterinary doctors. They love their flocks and, their, and it's part of their livelihood, just like the Fulanese in Nigeria and veterinary uh, veterinaries, vets are working among them can be very, very efficient for opening up their hearts to the gospel. Will you pray for God to send some veterinarians among them? Pray for God to send provision for those who are already working among these people there. The, the wonderful thing, there's a few, a small, small number of missionaries already among these people, but they need your prayers. And let's pray that God will make their witness and their preaching and communication powerfully anointed to penetrate into the hearts of these people. And maybe God will call you to be the answer to your prayers. God might be calling you to not just pray, but to go and to give. There's a lot of resources needed to sustain the work among these people. Would you consider today what God might be calling you to do among the Anjuran people of Northeastern Kenya? And then uh, you can use the information on the screen. Contact us today and we can help you become a solution in terms of seeing these ethnic groups one for Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us this week. I really appreciate having you with us. And uh, this is where we would we'll call it a day. I will, I'll see you same station, same time next week. Thank you so much. Please like this video and leave a comment below. Let's know what you think. And don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell button and share this video with somebody else.